Um, and then coming from the longest journey, I guess, coming from Peru, um, Carlos Monge, who is, um, well, you're, you're, you're down as Revenue Watch Institute, Peru, but you actually have quite a few hats, don't you, Carlos? You, um, you also work for the group Propuesta Ciudadana, Citizen Proposal, um, which works, so you're, you're looking at the extractive industries, but also you do a lot on budget monitoring and promoting both accountability and budget participation. Great. So my first question to all of the panelists, um, and maybe I'll start with Carlos, um, is just tell us what your main lines of work are, and out of all the possible things that you could have done in Peru to fight against corruption, to promote accountability, to promote participation, how did you decide to focus on the ones that you are working on? Well, in, in Peru, uh, with support from Revenue Watch Institute and from OSI and others, my home base institution, which is an NGO network, uh, has two strong lines of uh, monitoring. One is uh, monitoring the, especially the budget performance of subnational governments. The other one is uh, monitoring uh, all the fiscal aspects of uh, the extractive industries, oil, uh, mining, and gas. Uh, the reason why we do this is uh, twofold. On one hand, we see that uh, monitoring is a, is a tool to, maybe not to avoid, but uh, at, at least to prevent or to diminish the margins uh, for corruption. If we have people keeping an eye on the way uh, regional and local governments uh, access their budgets and spend their budgets and, and assign priority to in the way they spend their budgets, that sort of uh, diminishes the margins for, um, for corruption. The same with uh, the way companies pay taxes and royalties and the way the government uses the resources that come in from the, from the extractive sector. On the other hand, accessing such information is like a precondition for a well-informed civil society engagement in, in policy debates and, and in planning and budgeting exercises uh, for the future. So both for the sake of uh, preventing corruption and for the sake of fostering citizens and civil society engagement in participation in different aspects of uh, decision making at the public level, we find that the tools provided by the approach of freedom of information, having a good law of freedom of information, and having citizens that are informed about the way to use the law, exercise their rights, access information, analyze information, those are like preconditions that set the stage for, uh, uh, for the fight against corruption and for the fight for, for civil society engagement in, in public policies. Okay, thanks. And did you, um, just a couple of follow-up questions. Did the Peruvian Access to Information Law was adopted in 2002 yes. and came into force, I think, six months after it was adopted, yes. if my memory serves me right. Um, was, this, was this work that you started after the adoption of the law, was it a kind of new opportunity that you saw, or had you already been trying to gather this information before the law came into force? Um, monitoring had started... Uh, about at the same time as, as the law uh, was discussed and, and implemented, but we had some monitoring exercises even before that. What we have found is that having a good law on freedom of information, maybe it's not a condition, you can fight for, to access information and, and, and to get people informed and engaged without having a good law, uh, but having a good law has facilitated enormously um, our work. Now, uh, now part of our work is making the law known and, 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 and making people aware that they have the right to access information, that there is a law and there are specific tools and, and, and things that they can do uh, regarding this because the fact that we have a law in a country with 24 million people doesn't mean that 24 million people know about the law and, and mm -hmm. can exercise their rights. So we, we know that we still have a long way to go, but having a good law, of course, is a, is a very but, good but starting but point. But for, but for the work that you're actually doing, having the law and being able to file requests yes. and get answers has made a difference to the work that you're has doing. has made a difference and, and has, ma has made a lot of people that otherwise would not be interested in the subject. I mean, a lot of people who are interested in mining, in gas, in oil, in environmental impacts, in the role that these interests play in development, now they are the staunchest defenders of the law and they are the best users of the law. And not because they are into freedom of inf uh, information mm -hmm. or they are per se interested in that, but because they see that's an indispensable condition for what they do, which is uh, 
very sectorally focused work. Right, so by, by showing them the value of the law, you have allies to defend the right of access to information uh, as well. I, I think that the fight for the law and to defend the law has a broader basis of support as we manage to engage people who otherwise are not interested in that per se, but are working on mm -hmm. health or mining or, or, or whatever specific issue. Okay, that's, that's a very interesting point, which picks up on, I think, something that came out of yesterday morning session about the need to um, build allies in, in defense of freedom of information and to get uh, a wider number of people using the laws that they exist. I'll ask a few reflections to finish with. Yes, briefly. First, uh, Solid monitoring uh, has allowed us to be perceived by the media as a serious source of information. Uh, Propuesta Ciudadana is usually quoted in the national media through two or three times a day in any debate regarding budget expenditures, transparency, natural resources, whatever. No? Uh, second, in terms of things that I think can, can document change, uh, first, uh, in the 10, 10 out of the 26 regions of the country where, where Propuesta works, I think we have managed to, to build a situation in which you have a bunch of NGOs, you have a civil society leadership, and you have local journalists that are absolutely aware about freedom of information, ways to access public information, the way that regional governments perform in terms of the handling of their money, participatory mechanisms, transparency, and whatnot. And that has allowed us to, to work with these civil society leaderships to move into the participatory planning and budgeting processes so uh, as opposite to 10 years ago, now there is no way local and subnational authorities in those regions can make decisions regarding how to spend the money without going through these participatory processes. And I think that has not, of course, eliminated, but has diminished to a certain extent the, the margins of corruption. But we, in fact, we have diminished the discretionary powers of these uh, subnational authorities. Um, Third, at the national level, being a credible source of information has allowed Propuesta Ciudadana to become the leading civil society organization in the national EITI process. And because we had all the information built on, 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 on solid monitoring, we were able to put up a fight with the government and with the companies within the EITI to force increasing levels of transparency beyond the EITI mandate. We have managed to go into disaggregated disclosure of information, we have managed to bring into the ITI process the, the idea not only of the payments, but the use of the money and the subnational use of the money, which is sort of expanding the, the borders of the international uh, EITI process. And finally, uh, because this has to be a dynamic approach to reality, we have, in the context of a broader Revenue Watch Institute uh, decision, an international decision, but it was very much influenced by the Peruvian situation, we have decided now to go beyond the fiscal aspects of transparency in the monitoring of natural resources. So now we are starting to apply the freedom of information approach, for example, to uh, starting with a decision to extract or not to extract. Why is the government saying, yes, we are going to extract oil? Who is winning with that? Is it the country, is it the company, or is it the local communities? Or what if it was better to just keep the oil under the ground and go for sustainable use of other natural resources? in that area. No? So, so we, we are applying the same approach that we have used historically for fiscal matters, no? all the way to uh, the decision to extract or not to extract on one extreme, which is building a bridge with the environmental movement, nationally and we hope internationally, and on the other extreme to apply the same approach to demand information regarding the impact of the extraction of natural resources. Is it really bringing more democracy? If it really bringing more, more, uh, more development? or is it just benefiting a number of companies and a number of officials, but democracy remains weak and poverty still in place after years of extraction. So we are broadening the scope in the search for new social actors that can be brought into these processes to make them credible and to avoid a situation in which it's just an NGO thing. It has to be a social thing, a thing of the peoples, no? Okay, well, that's, thank you very much. That's a very nice uh, thought to end on, I think, converting the NGO thing into the social thing and moving um, from accountability to participation back in the decision-making cycle.